Have no fear. The robots are here. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 233rd episode of the Sales Podcast. I am Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. My wife is gone, and I have screaming kids coming in and out of the door. So I will try to do this recording with this chaos going on. But I am a professional. I am focused. I am here to serve you. But if you hear screaming kid, that's why. She's blowing bubbles out front. If you missed the last episode, go back. David Hutchinson, the saleswhisperer.com forward slash session 232. He's with Fire Up Training. For 17 years, he's been retained by Cisco. He and his company helping them present better. And he answers the one question, the one thing you must focus on when you go in to speak and to present. And that one shift will change your impact and your outcome for everyone in attendance and for you and your company. So if you did not listen to that, go check it out. Today, you're in for a treat. Chris Orlob, he is using artificial intelligence to study and monitor sales calls. And they are determining, they are um, figuring out, right, through objective reality, through observation, exactly what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, what topics should be broached and when, including price. And they are predicting outcomes accurately on sales forecasting. So you, this blew my mind when I ran across what he's doing and it's accelerating. Okay. So the robots are here. They're not here to take over your job just yet. They'll help you do your job better. And Hey, you know what? As long as you're number one, you will always have a job. So you know, roll up your sleeves. You're in for a treat here. Uh, and along those lines, you've heard me mention this and I'm reinforcing this. I'm doubling and tripling down on why you need to surround yourself with motivated, like-minded people. I've been doing that in jujitsu. I'm heading to that right now. As soon as I finish this recording, it's Valentine's day. I'm recording this intro a little early, uh, based on when this goes live. I am sore, Uh, But I am having fun. I'm being pushed literally beyond my comfort zone. And this is what you can do when you are, A, with a professional, right? My professor, my instructor has done this almost his entire life, certainly his entire adult life. And he has won multiple world championships. So I am literally with the best. But I'm with other cool people. I'm with two other guys that join the same time as me. One is older, one is younger. I'm with uh, other white belts, other blue belts, purple belts, even some black belts. And being around those guys that are all humble and a few ladies, uh, they are looking to learn. They realize that this is an ongoing journey and they're enjoying the journey, even though it's tough sometimes, even though it's very humiliating at times. I've had older guys beat me. I've had younger guys beat me, smaller guys beat me. Because these techniques take time to learn. So are you willing to put in the time and the effort? Are you surrounding yourself with people that encourage you to help you along the way? Help pick you up literally off the mat. Dust yourself off and do it again. That's what the Make Every Sale course is all about. And one payment, you get lifetime access. Or you can split it up on the 12 payments, which are less than the monthly payments I'm paying now for jujitsu. Uh, And I have to pay that forever. All right. You can join us. And you know what? The group is still small. So if you want almost private support, get in now. Because as this grows, you're going to have less and less access to me. But there's nothing I won't discuss. Okay. If you ask an honest question, I'll give you an honest answer about sales, marketing, copywriting. You know, I'll critique your landing page. Look at your website. Look at your presentations if we have time. But if you're willing to share it in in our private group, you'll get feedback on it. Okay. So you got nothing to lose, everything to gain. Make every sale.com. Get out of your comfort zone. Make it happen before these robots take over. Now let's bring on Chris. Chris Orlob. Gong.io. All the way from Utah, welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? I am doing fantastic. 
feet are above ground, as I always say. I have nothing to complain about. Thanks for having me, Wes. And if you did complain, nobody would listen, right? Wouldn't do me any good. So just get on with it. Uh, yeah. So, hey, man, we uh, we ran across each other. Uh, I was clearing out my inbox and found an old email from you. Maybe not too old, but uh, I'd kind of missed it. Um, but your your little tagline on the footer said, we analyzed 25,537 B2B sales conversations using AI. That's a artificial intelligence for you people that do not know what that means. Here are the five things we discovered. So I was like, okay, wait the wait the wait. <laughs> Let's talk about this. So what the heck is that? What did you learn? Well, I think to kind of, give some context of the analysis. We're constantly analyzing sales calls uh, with the Gong Artificial Intelligence platform. And the article and email I sent you was kind of our first cohort of analysis. This was the 25,537 B2B sales conversation. So to give you a little insight on that analysis, uh, there were 17 customer organizations that we pulled this data from. It was anonymized sales conversation data. And these were account executive calls. So these were calls conducted on the go to meetings of the world, join me, Zoom, WebEx, about 43 minutes on average each. Uh, so the implication there is they weren't prospecting calls. We'll get to that in another cohort, but for now, stuck with these. And here's how we analyzed it. Each call was recorded using Gong automatically on these conference call platforms. The calls were recorded, transcribed from speech to text, cleaned, and then mapped to their corresponding CRM outcomes so that we could analyze the call data against their CRM outcomes. And finally, we ran the Gong Artificial Intelligence Engine through this massive data set. And what that did is it auto-categorized call topics, key moments, seller buyer behaviors, different kind of stuff like that, mapped them against their outcomes. And lo and behold, our first cohort revealed five pretty unmistakable patterns. Very interesting. 43 minutes. All right. Do, do you know like the average sale of each of these like dollar wise? As far as dollar wise, no, because it, it varied quite a bit depending on what these companies were selling. Most of them were SaaS companies. I do know the average sales cycle. It was typically between 60 to 90 days. So not very high velocity, but definitely not the longest sales cycle in the world. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not terrible. Yeah. Um, and then do you know what level they were calling into? Like were these C-level conversations? Were these director level? Yeah, typically VP and director level, there were a little bit of C-level where the deal required the sign-off like that. Okay. Uh, again, all of this was pulled from the CRM data that was in Salesforce.com, like whether or not there was a C-level executive attached to the opportunity. Right. And so – you know, let's have everybody download this report. So let's give them maybe two or three of the five things you discovered. Sure. So the first one is the talk to listen ratio. I think just about every sales veteran can pat themselves on the back when they hear this because we all intuitively know we should uh, talk a little bit less and listen more. Uh, turns out the quote unquote highest converting talk to listen ratio is 4357, meaning the sales rep had spent 43% of the call talking while letting the prospect talk 57% of the time. Now, what's interesting is that the average sales rep, the average B2B sales rep actually talks between 65 and 75% of their calls. Wow. So there's quite this disparity between what top performers are doing and what average performers are doing. But right. the, the hopeful thing is if you're talking a lot, it actually doesn't take much to start seeing results. Um, if you can just increase your prospects talk time from a mere 22% of the call, up to 33% of the call, your win rates will shoot up somewhere between 30 to 35%. Now, the final point I want to make about win rates and really every piece of this research is that correlation doesn't always equal causation. You right. know, we're not saying the root cause of sales success is all of this, but we did find the patterns among sales or successful sales conversations um, pattern themselves after what we're talking about here. Right. And, you know, if you'd like a very good program to help with that, I might recommend, you know, the makeeverysale.com. But anyway, I digress. Uh, I've always said, you know, whoever's asking the questions is in control of the conversation. 
Mm-hmm. Right? And we always see people, oh, you have the gift of gab. You've never met a stranger. You're really good with people. You should be in sales. I'm like, oh, my gosh, poor human <laughs> being. They're in for a world of hurt. And so is the prospect that has to deal with that person doing all the talking. Yeah. Unfortunate is the prospect who has to deal with that person. <laughs> All right. So talk to listen. I like that. Uh, what's number two? Number two is th- there's kind of a double whammy with number two because it's around pricing discussions. Oh. So one of them is less a sales technique and it's more of a buying signal. Uh, the other is a quote unquote sales technique. The first one is the buying signal. So we discovered that the highest performing sales conversations involved the customer or potential customer mentioning pricing three to four times. Uh, If the potential customer mentioned price less than three times or more than four times, win rates gradually decline. So three to four times is kind of the holy grail. Uh, The takeaway for sales professionals is not that they should manufacture their conversations in a way that artificially gets the prospect to talk about pricing three to four separate separate times. It's more so around reading buying signals. If you hear it come up three to four times, you should probably uh, prioritize your sales opportunities accordingly. Uh, the second one is a little bit more actionable, though, and it's when do top performers discuss price in their conference calls? And I'll have to share this image with you, so maybe you can put it up um, you know, on your website or whatever the case is, about the dis- distribution among pricing discussions throughout a sales call. Okay. Top performers, by and large, discuss pricing most often between the 40 and 49 minute window of their sales calls, where average and low performers pretty evenly distribute throughout the entire call where pricing is discussed. Hmm. All right. So low. So, so top performers wait till the end. Mm-hmm. And yeah. The moral of the story is are discussing it earlier. Exactly. So, the, you know, this is another one where we can kind of pat ourselves on the back, but it's great to have data to validate all of this stuff. Um, establish value, then talk price. There's your takeaway. Uh, interesting. Because that could go a couple of ways, but, I mean, hey, the facts are the facts. <laughs> so establish value, then discuss price. All right. Now, but again, this is in B2B, right? Um, mm-hmm versus business to consumer. Um, but um, it would be interesting to see, like, what type of ballpark did the prospect at least think? You know, I've I've spent, you know, nine years now in the software as a service space around sales and marketing automation. And so companies like Infusionsoft, HubSpot, Entreport, those their prices are published. You know, so the fact we're even having a conversation, uh, people already know what the price is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. (laughs) Well, the the point I was going to make is you could be totally right. Uh, This could be totally different for B2C or lower velocity B2B where pricing is published. Um, That's why we keep our analysis cohorted. You know, this one was specific to SaaS companies with a certain length of sales cycle. Right. Uh, and we'll eventually you know, cohort other analyses like sales development calls and different stuff like what you're talking about here. Yeah. It's like on the sales development, because I always tell people hearing no early is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I'll, if somebody is is totally just shooting from the hip, they're just in the dark. I don't want to spend six months educating and nurturing them. You know, I want to have this conversation like, Chris, you know, thanks for giving me a call. I understand you're looking for some software. You know, the, the, you know, the, the price point that I typically deal in is, you know, is you're looking at two to $5,000 for a setup. You're looking at 800 to $3,000 a month for the typical platform. You know, so does that just totally blow your budget out of the water? Uh, or if it's right, you know, can you see making those uh, budget ranges fit? You know, so we can then continue the conversation, right? Because if you're like, oh, God, I, I got, I have seven dollars and and six empty <laughs> bags full of Coke cans. I thought that, you know, like I, I want to know that now, yeah. Right, but that's more in in the pre-sale, right? Yeah, totally different discussion too. It, as much as I believe, you know, I'm qualified to answer a question like that about 
you know, what I think you should do in those situations. Uh, the data is yet to be qualified to tell us what to do there. We just haven't gotten there yet. Right. Cool. Uh, that's still interesting though. I like that. Um, so what, uh, what other little nuggets can you share with us? Well, the next was around forecasting the deal based on conversation signals. So what words and phrases are our potential customers using in our sales conversations that signal the deal is likely to close and also signal that the deal may be dead in its tracks? And the first one was the word probably. So any good sales rep with worth his or her salt, any B2B sales rep is going to ask the timeline question at some point. You know, what, when do you estimate on moving forward with this project? It turns out we found a correlation between forecast accuracy, win rates, and the prospect using the word probably in responding to that question. So an example would be, we're probably going to move forward between November or December, or probably in a couple weeks or something like that. If they use that word, there's been a 73% jump in forecast accuracy. So again, just want to make the point. Correlation is not always causation. We're not making the claim that if your prospect says the word probably after you ask that question, you are certainly going to close them because that is the cause of closing deals. Uh, What we're really suggesting is our data has shown a very high correlation between those two things. So just keep that in mind. Proceed accordingly. Um, On the other side of this forecasting coin, though, we also found a negative conversational signal Uh, in response to the timeline question. So here's what I mean. If you ask the timeline question and the prospect responds with some variation of, we need to figure out fill in the blank, there's a negative correlation as far as getting the deal done within your estimated forecast and closing the deal entirely. So some examples of that are, we need to figure out who gives the final go ahead for this, or we need to figure out how we're going to justify ROI, or we need to figure out where budget's coming from. If you hear stuff like that, it can sometimes be phrased as a positive thing, like, hey, we should be good to go with this by the end of the year. We just need to figure out who gives the final go ahead. (coughs) Excuse me. If you hear something like that, I wouldn't necessarily give up on your deal, but as a sales professional, you deserve to know the data which says your chances of success are starting to dwindle if you do hear that phrase. There's probably good ways to deal with the phrase, but um, that's where you stand. Yeah, I I can totally see that one. Uh, I'm I'm thinking about that first one, though, probably, because... I'm letting that kind of noodle and percolate because my initial response, I was thinking, oh, that's the negative correlation Mm -hmm. because that probably shows in my mind, uh, lack of commitment. Um, but I guess like when you're sitting there face to face or you've had several meetings, uh, and you ask and and, you know, it's tonality, it's everything. Right. And they go, you know what? Well, I mean, we're probably going to get this launch, you know, this quarter, or, you know, we're probably going to be able to pull the trigger on it by the end of the month. I mean, it's, in one way, I can see that it shows that you're moving in the right direction. Uh, but to me, it's still non-committal. Right? It's very non-committal. That, and that's what's so interesting about it. And I didn't really understand it until I had to purchase a few marketing technologies on behalf of Gong. And here's my theory behind this. When you hear non-committal language from your prospect, it's because they're taking the purchase very seriously. They don't want to be pushed into a corner by a sales rep who has happy ears, and their head is on the chopping block if they make a poor purchase decision, so they are being pretty cautious. However, if you hear a bunch of gung-ho language from a prospect like, yes, we are for sure ready to get on with this, you know that that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you should also keep in mind Why isn't this person feeling pre-purchase anxiety? Are they not planning on moving forward? Is their head not actually on the chopping block? Because most people, um, if they're making some sort of big ticket purchase on behalf of their company, they're going to start to get a little bit nervous because if they make a stupid decision, depending on the culture of the company, they can get into a lot of trouble. That's, That's been my latest theory on this one. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I get into the whole disc model in uh, my training. Uh, you know, the dominance, uh, the the high flying eyes versus the steady relators and the and the compliance. You know, like the hard driving D's. You know, they they're kind of tough to get a commitment from. 
Um, but I can see them, you know, looking like, hey, don't pressure me, but like, we're probably going to get started. You know, just, just lay off. Things are moving fine. But those high eyes, they are, that, that's, like you said, they're the gung ho. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic. I can't wait to get this started. Everybody in the company is going to love it. You know, and that, and that salesperson, they're like, oh, yes. You know, they call the boss, it's ready, order the champagne. You know, and you call that prospect a day or two later, they don't even remember having a conversation with you. <laughs> uh, let alone like that they're they're committing them they're like what i'm buying what well, what's your name again you know have we met like yeah dude you know we spent yeah, three and- hours at lunch and yes you were, <laughs> you said ah um so that's interesting right you got to know the people but uh this is really interesting what what made y'all even think of doing this the sh- just because of the capabilities with we have with our software, you know, this has actually been a dream of mine before I even started at Gong. Um, you and I were just talking before this podcast interview. You asked me how long I've been with Gong. Um, I started a competing company against Gong a while ago, and one of my ultimate visions was to take some of the guesswork out of what works in sales because there are so many holy wars about what works, what doesn't work. Everybody has extremely heated opinions about that kind of stuff, and they always will. Sales will never be reduced completely to a science. But the fact that we can introduce some level of science to this uh, gives a lot of people some high hope because we don't have to sit here throwing spaghetti at the wall as to what we think maybe works. Now we can validate some of this with analytics and artificial intelligence and science. So, you know, what I, I stopped my old venture that was competing with Gong to join Gong because of how much further along they were, their funding and that kind of stuff. And their product is able to pick out these leading indicators of sales conversation success and also the indicators of sales conversation failure. Um, and it's just kind of a sales geeks nightmare or not nightmare, uh, dream, um, right. super fascinating stuff. Now, are you finding your clients, um, are they creating better scripts? You know, or are they taking this, this knowledge, uh, and, and training their salespeople, creating voicemail scripts. I mean, does it work in email as well? Uh, you know, how, how are people using this? The only thing I'll say about email is stay tuned, um, for now, but yes, people are picking apart the insights they're learning from their sales conversations and distributing those best practices across their sales team in the form of training. So when we have customers that do that, we still always hammer home the point, hey, guys, as awesome as this stuff is, and you should be using it as training, keep in mind correlation still doesn't equal causation. So, yes, top performers are speaking about pricing between the 40 to 49-minute mark. Um, you should encourage your reps to do the same, but you should also encourage them to use their judgment. There are going to be times where they should break that rule. You know, they, sh- they shouldn't follow that every single time without fail. Right. You know, they say um, good judgment comes from experience, but um, experience comes from bad judgment. Yeah, Tony Robbins. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So then are you consulting with the clients or how, where does Gong come in? Do they just buy the software and, and, or, or do you have like a whole service component as well? Nope, no service component. So the software is, you know, it's the easiest to install software platform or B2B sales software platform I've ever seen in my life takes about three to five minutes to get going. And they do the analysis themselves. They do the call coaching through the platform themselves. Uh, The only thing we do as far as a service, which is an unpaid service, is we publish this content for not only our customers to see, but really the world to see just because this is interesting stuff. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I mentioned that, that report, you know, the five things we discovered. So are you delivering that as a PDF or do you have, do you do webinars? How, how do you educate the public? A little bit of everything. The first ever article was posted in conjunction with sales hacker. So you can find that article on sales hacker. It was the most shared sales hacker article of all time. I think the average amount of shares is around 60. That one got 1200. 
And all of this research is going to be live on our website, I'm hoping February 1st, 2017. We have it all in the staging environment on WordPress right now. We're just getting ready to make the final edits and publish that. So pretty soon you can just go to gong.io. There's going to be a research tab, and you can research or read through all of the research that we've published. And we'll continue to put out more research content as we gather more insights. Okay, cool. Well, I will, uh, this episode will go live in late February. So, uh, it gives you a little bit of wiggle room to make sure you hit that February mark. All right. <laughs> Don't make me come back. I'll come up there. I will ski you to death. All right. And make sure uh, it's public. <laughs> I'm just saying. You probably would ski me to death. I, <laughs> I'm one of those sinful Utahns who has lived in Utah his whole life, but doesn't ski. I've meant to get into skiing just hasn't happened yet. Well, I've tried snowboarding with my kids, and I don't know. I, I can get down the mountain, but it ain't pretty. I, I didn't. I didn't start skiing. When I was in college and uh, got pretty good. Um, haven't skied a lot, but I uh, certainly much more nimble on skis than a than a snowboard. So I don't know. I, I don't. I, I'll probably do snowboarding one more time just to see. But uh, man, I'm an old dog. I'll be 47 here in a couple months. I, I can't be learning new tricks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, unfortunately i do know what you're saying yeah, I, i've got my second child due here in a couple of weeks um i'm only 25 but my hair has been halfway turned gray so i'm i'm like 70 years old on the inside wait till you have seven kids man then then talk to me all right so just yeah i'm not know. gonna plan on that <laughs> i didn't plan on it either <laughs> one is already outnumbering me i always tell people the fifth was the only one we tried to have and that's a true story. <laughs> Craziness. Uh, all right. So this will be live. Uh, your content will be live uh, when this episode goes live. Uh, any other nuggets you want to share with our listeners? You know, I always like to say, you know, imagine they're, they're, they're jogging, they're on a plane, they're on a bike. They can't take uh, notes or do anything right now. What, what should they do? What should our listeners do as soon as they can take action uh, as a result of this interview uh, to improve their sales? Well, there are two things I would submit as a call to action. The first would be go to gong.io to check out our research content since it's going to be live by then. But also if there are any B2B sales leaders listening, I would just like to bring awareness as to what gong is to them. Um, gong is typically for sales leaders who have a big number sitting over their, their head this year or the year ahead. Uh, it's the number one sales conversation intelligence platform. What it does is it gives you x-ray vision into your sales team's calls by automatically recording, transcribing, and analyzing 100% of their conversations using artificial intelligence so that you can ensure they're putting their best foot forward in order to hit that big annual number you may have hanging around your neck. Uh, one of the philosophies we have over here at Gong is the sales reps that are most in need of coaching will never remember to manually hit the record button on their conference call tool. Hmm. Gong is going to do that all without your sales reps having to lift a finger. So if any of that resonated whatsoever, check out gong.io to learn more. That's www.gong.io. Very nice. Like they say, if you can measure it, you can improve it, right? That's right. Uh, yeah, this is amazing. All right, we're going to have to have you on the uh, CRM Sushi podcast, but we'll discuss that later. All right, man. Chris Orlob, all the way from Utah, gong.io. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast, man. It's been cool. Wes, thanks for having me. All right, man. Have a great day. So they analyzed 25,537 B2B sales conversations using AI. And here are the five things we discovered. Did you write them down? That uh, was some crazy good information. And like we said, you know, some of it was a little surprising. Um, I'm glad we were able to talk through it uh, and see, you know, where my thinking was a little off, where it was on. Uh, but having specifics, having facts, having this type of definitive information is going to help you. Okay, I love how he opened up with the talk to listen ratio. You know, two ears, one mouth, use them proportionately. Um, I was a little surprised on those numbers, but again, we dove into it. So it, it you know, started to make sense. Uh, the buying signal I means so important. Uh, the word probably that kind of surprised me. Uh, but Hey, I, again, we were able to dive in and, you know, 73% jump in forecast accuracy. So that's, 
That's interesting. Uh, I love these, the negative conversation signals. You know, there's stuff out there that you can use. And that's what I'm doing here is finding interesting people, cutting edge stuff, peeling it back, getting to the truth to help you have actionable ideas and information so you can grow your sales. All right, so go check him out. Check out his platform. Uh, I link to it uh, in the notes. You can get to everything at thesaleswhisperer.com. And then today is session 233. So put that at the end. So forward slash session 233. Uh, I link to his articles. I link to their Twitter account, link to his homepage. Um, this is important stuff. These, this artificial intelligence is here to stay. It's going to accelerate. Uh, use it to your advantage, okay? And again, inside of the Make Every Sale program, makeeverysale.com, I'm going to start bringing in guest experts. I'm going to bring in guys like this, you know, Chris, uh, to do a little private Q&A. So tools uh, and techniques and opportunities that you won't get on a free episode like this. Uh, so head on over. Check that out, makeeverysale.com. You can make a one-time payment or you can make 12 payments. Uh, and it's less than what I'm paying to get beat up in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which I'm heading to now. Thanks for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast. That helps with the uh, appearance in the rankings. And the more people, you know, the higher up the show is ranked, the more that will find it, the more they'll find it, the more that I'll sell through my recommendations and visits to my site, which helps me keep this free, which helps me help more people. All right. Thanks for listening. Remember to sell different. 